All right. Well, thank you everyone for coming today. My name is Darren Lowe, and I'm going to be facilitating uh, the presentation. Uh, we are doing a great webinar on navigating a world full of payroll compliance, um, sponsored by Ult Ultimate Software and Solergo. We have two really esteemed speakers today, Cecile LaRue and Michelle Hanna-Michael. Um, we are going to be taking questions. So if you do have a question, I will be moderating those questions uh, for you. Uh, so please feel free as we go through, uh, go through the webinar to, uh, to uh, you know, type in the questions as you guys feel. We also are going to have 10 minutes at the end where we're going to be taking questions. So if you have some questions in, in between, we may jump in, but we're going to have 10 minutes at the end for questions. Um, and also, we'll be sending out the webinar uh, later this week uh, to everyone who uh, participated. So you will have an opportunity to uh, get a recording of the webinar. Uh, that said, I'd like to introduce Cecile Alper the Root, uh, who's the Vice President of uh, Human Capital Management Ultimate Software. And uh, we'll get started. Thank you very much, Darren. And I, um, since Ultimate and Solergo have been partners for a number of years, I'm delighted to be able to co-present with Michelle an incredible that puts people first. If we go to the next slide then, Tim. The reason that we partner uh, with Solergo also is that Solergo has a very deep understanding um, and a very comprehensive solution. The way that Solergo handles fully managed payroll in over 150 countries is they have a very, very collaborative solution. They have a broad network and very, very deep domain expertise. They started out really looking at guidance. They truly understand. So we understand how to be able to support uh, customers. And when we think about that partnership, we're always looking at how we can work um, and provide a single uh, holistic solution for our customers with both UltiPro and Solergo. Um, the money movement is also a huge risk and a challenge for organizations, and that's also something that, as a whole, Solergo is able to offer, um, which truly brings a great deal of, of value to customers. And Darren, I don't know if at this point you'd wanted to add anything? No, I think that's great, Cecile. Thank okay. you. Great. Let's talk a little bit then about why this is so important, uh, global compliance. The globalized workforce is without a doubt growing. Uh, today, in fact, NY uh, projects that <clears throat> there are only 9% of organizations that have, uh, that have their entire employee base in their company's headquarters country, uh, which means that easily 91% of countries or of companies have operations in one or more, in, in more than one country, um, many of them in over 30, 40 countries. And so this is something that continues to grow. And if you look at that less, the 40% of profits for organizations in the S&P 500 are coming from overseas. They're coming from their global operations. So that's inching very close to more than half or half of their, their uh, their profits are coming from uh, other regions, which means that that globalized workforce and the complexity is going to continue to grow. Another important aspect of the globalization and, um, and how our workforce is changing is that 72% of CEOs and organizations report having difficulty finding the right talent, the right global talent, to be able to truly be competitive in the global market. So that's a vast majority of organizations are really struggling with finding the right people. So that is going to continue to grow. And what that means is they will be looking more and more toward local resources and cross-training them as they move forward. Go on to the next slide. <clears throat> it's important to not forget, as we're looking at the global workforce, that in order to keep employees, in each country, in different countries, there are different drivers for why an employee will stay with an organization. It's sometimes purely financial, but more and more we're finding that with the increase in the gig economy globally, it's now between 20 and 40 percent of the global workforce is known to be uh, contract or contingent or part-time employees, and they are moving more fluidly between uh, permanent work. And it's important to be able to keep and engage your global workforce. Um, engagement is something that is different per country. So it's very important to understand different cultures and the people 
and what their expectations are. But it's also really, really critical to make sure that you get the basics right, and that's something that so often organizations will not get right, and you cannot rebuild that trust, which is a huge factor uh, if you have missed some of the basics with your employees. Employees, once they have a bad experience, are not likely to stay, and so it's very, very important to get those mission-critical things, such as your payroll, absolutely right. Um, the other important thing that we found working with customers that are um, Ultimate and Solergo customers together is they found that having a unified solution really, really helps with connectedness across the globe and with the engagement of their workforce. So it's really important to have a holistic solution where partners are speaking very closely uh, with each other, understanding each other, and delivering a, a phenomenal experience to employees across the globe. So let's talk a little bit and start digging into these uh, four major trends and getting into the meat of the presentation. When we think about global operations, first and foremost, we all have to understand that it increases your exposure. Whenever you have multiple locations, you're increasing the complexity, and with increasing complexity of your operations, you're also increasing your exposure. Um, one of the things that increases your, your exposure, without a doubt, are some of the things that we're going to talk about today, some of the regulations that are varied and different by country, uh, cybersecurity threats that continue to be a challenge across the globe. And oftentimes what we find is that payroll compliance is treated as just a single country's problem, but it really isn't. It's something that has to do with the integrity of your global operations and also ensuring the engagement of your employees across the globe. So it's important to manage your risk and compliance within this context of increasing and rapidly uh, globalizing operations. Let's talk a little bit then about uh, incre the, the increasing importance of cybersecurity. Just to give you a sense of, the, of what's happening with cybersecurity today, if we go to the next slide, There are so many different kinds of threat. I'm sure you've seen um, and heard of, hopefully you haven't actually had to directly deal with these, but phishing schemes, malware, uh, infected computers, firewall uh, challenges, there are hackers, there's, there's internet crime, etc. Just to give you a sense, <clears throat> the, the, um, the drug industry alone in North America is estimated to be a $6 billion industry. Cybersecurity is an $800 billion, uh, uh, an eight, I'm sorry, $800 million uh, industry today. So it's a significant challenge for organizations to deal with and incredibly costly. So in what we estimate, if you go to the next slide, if we estimate what cyber crime, I'm sorry, it was billion, I apologize. For if we estimate what cyber crime is going to cost organizations, by 2019, keep in mind that's just a year and a half away, it's, it's considered um, and estimated to be a $2 trillion cost to businesses. Uh, and this is a huge, huge challenge for organizations because not only do you have to be prepared, um, you want to be proactive when it comes to some of these challenges. And a lot of what we can do is identify best practices globally that can really help minimize some of the challenges. Go to the next slide, Drew. So it sounds really, really basic, but creating stronger passwords is one of the most important things that an organization can do. Um, another, uh, another great way of managing access to uh, protected data or any data that can get uh, a hacker through a system is by using password generators and multi-factor authentication. So the more complex, the better your passwords will be. And it's critical to think about that when we look at cybersecurity and some of the challenges that organizations face. If you think of those, those threats that, uh, that we talked about just, uh, just a moment ago, a lot of those could be avoided with better password management, as simple as that sounds. If you go to the next slide, some other best practices to consider across the globe is to never reuse passwords across different systems. Encourage employees to have multiple, multiple um, passwords for the different systems. I don't know how many of you have actually 
seen antivirus scans and you sort of skip over those or, or delay them, let them run. It really does make a difference and can preemptively stop uh, some significant challenges. And then keep your computers secure. Apply those updates as often as possible. And we find this every single day um, within our organization also. You have to be aware of email requests and phishing campaigns. Those are one of the most, um, the most aggressive ways that organizations are, um, are actually allowing data to leave their systems in a protected fashion. So cybersecurity is an increasing threat, but there are a lot of really great simple things that you can do to avoid those challenges. For the next uh, major trend, uh, ensuring data privacy, I want to introduce my friend, or reintroduce my friend, uh, Michelle Hanna-Michael, who's, who's truly the expert when it comes to data privacy and is going to delve into some of the new changes when it comes to data privacy, some of the new regulations, and what you need to be aware of. Michelle? Thank you, Cecile. Uh, so what we're going to do right now is walk through some a basic overview of compliance trends that affect your organization really on a global scale. And we're going to look at EU data privacy, but just be aware that there are privacy components to almost every country. So you could starting to see them more in like Turkey and Russia and China, even here in the U.S. So it's really important that even though we're talking today about the EU, uh, that there are other countries that also face some of these challenges. So back in 2015 and 2016, it was a really chaotic time in Europe. We had the fall of safe Har the Safe Harbor Agreement, which was the uh, agreement that allowed companies in the U.S. and in Europe to transfer data back and forth, and that fell apart in October of 2015. And then in 2016, we ratified the Global the General Data Protection Regulation, which is a mouthful, or short uh, called short in short GDPR, and that was ratified in May of 2016. And we'll also talk about Privacy Shield, which is kind of the new safe harbor regulations, which allows companies in the U.S. to interact with companies in Europe and transfer data back and forth. So many companies are scrambling in in to look at and understand all the complexities of Privacy Shield and the GDPR, and then just for fun, let's throw in Brexit. So what really does, what, what is the difference between the 1995 EU Directive and the 2016 GDPR? And I've lined them up here so you can see what the old uh, directive elements are and what the new are. And interestingly enough, really they're very, very similar. So the intent is the same. The difference is, is back in 1995, we really didn't have the internet and internet companies and that data flow was much more restricted than it is today. So what the EU came up with is, okay, let's look at the current trends of how data is being moved, how data is being used, and how do we protect it. So you can see things like notice, purpose, consent, security, disclosure, access, and accountability. That was the original intent. And if you come over here to the right, you can see a lot of the same concepts are there. But they're starting to add on to that, like storage limitations and uh, confidentiality principles and components like that. So when you look at the new uh, GDPR, you say, OK, well, there is there is actually some good and some new challenges that come with this. So there are some improvements. So as we talked about on the previous slide, many of the core concepts are the same, which is great. So that is what companies are used to working with, and they understand that. But also there's some greater harmonization of requirements across the countries that are in the EU. So now companies only have to really comply with the GDPR versus having to worry about individual countries and their requirements for data protection. Um, also, there's more kind of a risk based compliance approach to this. So depending upon what data you are actually managing depends upon the level of risk you have with compliance with the GDPR as opposed to just kind of a blanket statement for everyone. Now on the other side of that, of course, is um, additional requirements. So there's a huge increase in enforcement. This is probably the big change, and we'll talk about in just a minute how, what those mean in the terms of penalties. But also, um, there is expanded territorial scope, 
consent is now cannot just be the fine print at the bottom of a box that you click because you really want to get onto that website. Consent has to be incredibly transparent. And that consent will include like how we're using your data, what we're using it for. Um, so you actually have to have that. And um, the programs, you're going to have your programs built at your organization that are designed to protect data. And you're going to need to have data protection officers. And the new big one here is that there used to always be this concept of controller, which in essence was the ultimate company that hires the employee. But now also processors. So people that companies send their data to, whether that's for HR or for, um, for payroll or for accounts payable or you know, if you're paying contractors, all those kinds of things, a processor now is required to comply with GDPR. So that is a big change. Another big change is the, um, you have to, employees or people who have data that you're utilizing have the right to access that data, fine, but they also have the right to ask you to re restrict it or erase it. And that's a big change to this organization. So just think about it this way. You've got controllers who determine the how and why of the data, and the processors execute that how and why. And if you don't do it properly, what you're going to happen is there's a big penalty that comes with that. So the penalties can run anywhere from 20, 10 to 20 million euro, or up to 2 to 4 percent of your revenue, whichever is higher. So that's why there's new teeth in this, in this whole regulation to ensure companies comply. So now when we talk about Privacy Shield, people say, okay, so what does that mean for me versus Safe Harbor? We used to be Safe Harbor, now we're with Privacy Shield. You know, how do I, how do I comply and what's kind of the difference? So the first one here, company obligations, is pretty much the same as safe harbor. So you know you have to have transparency, you have to have oversight, you have to have there's certain levels of sanctions and things that go with that. So most companies are relatively comfortable with that. The second part's a new part, which is enforcement, meaning if an employee comes to you and says, hey, I have a concern about my data or I feel that I feel that uh, it's been used improperly, etc., companies need to reply within 45 days to these complaints. And um, take it up to the DPA or Data Protection Authority if, if the concern has not been resolved. The third one is actually the interesting part. So this is the one that doesn't really affect us as corporations so, uh, per se, but the big reason why Safe Harbor fell apart was because of government access. So the U.S. was accessing uh, information about employees in the U.S. through corporate U.S. corporations. And the U.S. has, the U.S. government has stated that they will um, not do that anymore and not perform mass surveillance. So the last component of that is monitoring. So that means that the U.S. and the EU will get together periodically to review the program and determine if it's working or not and then report publicly their findings. So when you think about Privacy Shield, you know, if you need, you, if you have employees that are in the EU or do business with companies in the EU where you're passing or managing data, it is important for you to become Privacy Shield certified. So you can self-certify to this arrangement. Uh, there's a couple additional things you have to do is display your privacy policy, reply promptly to complaints as we talked about, and comply with any new rules and regulations coming out from the European DPA. You can do this online, and uh, to certify, you can go through that particular process. Another component that most companies look at, and if you have em employees in Europe, you're going to have to sign up for, is standard contractual clauses. So this allows a data exporter, which if you think about it, is typically a company that has employees, to, um, and Send, to be able to send data to a data importer, which typically is like an HR processor of your data, an administrative house, a, a payroll processor who's going to be managing that data for you. 
So it is a contract. It's a model contract. It cannot be negotiated, um, changed, etc. It's, it's a very specific set of clauses which allows uh, a data exporter and a data importer to exchange data in a secure format. So as part of those standard contractual agreements, you're going to talk about data transfer agreements, or DTAs. Now the interesting thing about DTAs is when you look at this, this is pretty much like IT data transfer 101. So if your company's got a pretty strong compliance group, um, gets audited regularly, which most of us are, uh, you should not have too much of an issue with these requirements because it's your basic access control button to the premises, to the data, uh, disclosure, how you handle inputs, is there a separation of, of duties, all these things are very consistent with audits, especially IT audits or financial audits. So most companies feel relatively comfortable with DTAs. So another top global trend that is coming about is there's, as, as Cecile alluded to earlier, is there's all these global programs and requirements that ensure that companies do not do basically deal with quote unquote, the bad people out there. In other words, terrorism, bribery, graft, uh, in, in properly moving money, et cetera. So we're going to talk about a couple of those. So our first one is global money movement. So we're going to discuss OFAC, which is the Office of Foreign Asset Control, and we're going to talk about wage protection systems, which are very common or most often seen here in the Gulf Cooperation Council, or a lot of people refer to it as the GCC. So under OFAC, people are like, okay, so what is that? OFAC is a US, uh, a US program which requires companies that either touch the US, have a US quote unquote citizen, which could be an entity, a branch, subsidiary, employees in the US, it's very, very far reaching. And it, it, it requires that these companies do not participate, support, work with, do business with people that are on the SDN list or specially designated nationals. So what that means is that's not only, you know, individual people, that could be countries, it could be banks, it could be organizations, all different kinds of um, people or entities appear on this SDN list. If a bank is doing business uh, with, with any U.S. organization, they're automatically already running your information through their compliance program, which part of this is doing a OFAC check. So what happens when you run an OFAC check and you actually get a hit? We're going to get another slide in a second. <laughs> it seems to be going slow here. Uh, you get to pay a nice big penalty. So it's, it's, when you think about it, you're like, okay, what's the big deal behind this? Well, the penalties run anywhere from $1,000, which is really not that big of a deal, all the way up to $250,000 per occurrence. So if you paid three or four people that happen to be on that OFAC list, just keep compounding. The bigger issue here, though, is not actually, I mean, yes, the penalties are large, but also there's additional consequences. So your banks may, if, if they don't catch it, it goes through, even after it goes through your compliance program, there's a penalty, but you also might get shut down from moving more money or making other payments or doing other business. So it's really important to be compliant, not just from a penalty standpoint, but from ensuring that your business continues. So how do I reduce these penalties? The most important thing is, um, is making sure you have a compliance program. And what that means is you have to have a compliance officer that manages the program. You have to run your employees through, and all the people that you work through with, through an OFAC screen. And you have to do that on a particular basis. Maybe you do it once before every payroll run. Maybe you do it once a month. It depends upon who you're running through and why you're actually screening those people. So that in case if for some reason you get a hit, and most hits will come back as false positive, but let's say you get an, a real hit and you have to actually go to the government and say, I have that hit, they will come back and review your compliance program. And if you have a pretty strong compliance program, that's going to reduce your, your um, 
a potential penalty. So how does that how does that actually work? So you're like, all right, well, how do I actually do this? There are a lot of systems out there. LexisNexis offers one. Is a, uh, a technology called Bridger, and you literally for employees need last name and first name. And then we always encourage that you have date of birth or city of origin or birthplace as a third point of disqualifier. So when you put that name through, it'll actually come back and say whether you have a hit or not. Um, some names are incredibly common, so that's why it's important for you to have date of birth to, de to disqualify that person or take them off the list um, and ensure that you are paying only those who uh, clear the OFAC list. The next thing I want to talk about is the wage protection system. So back in 2008, when there was a global recession, what happened is a lot of people in the Gulf Cooperation Council countries ended up not getting paid because much of their labor is inbound immigration. And so the government wanted to ensure and protect those employees and ensure that they get paid. So what happens today is once a, once a company runs payroll, they actually have to use a certified WPS uh, bank or organization that will process those payments to their employees. And then what will happen is technically the government could come out and audit and say, okay, this is the contract that you agreed to pay this person and this is the amount that was actually getting paid. The trick on this and why this is so important to bring up here is because in, in the old days, Back, you know, 10 years ago, you could just pay people in whatever currency you wanted. You could pay them at any time you wanted. And now these countries are really restricting this down to saying it has to be in, from a local bank account into a local bank account, has to be in local currency, etc. So it makes it a little more complex to actually make payments to many of these employees uh, in this region. So now let's get into some real fun. So we're going to talk about bribery because that's always an exciting topic. So uh, let's talk about FCPA, so Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which actually was passed quite a long time ago. And so as Cecile alluded, well, like, why do we really care? So we care because now the governments are starting to enforce them. So the U.S. is really looking at this and saying, hey, wait a second, we're really going to start enforcing it. You've seen actions significantly increase since 2011. So what does that mean? What is this uh, requirement? It prohibits the payment of bribes to foreign officials really to assist in obtaining or retaining business. The trick here is that foreign official it could be a UN official, it could be a politician, it could just be a doctor at a local hospital. So it's a very broad definition of who a foreign official is. So when we talk about, well, what are the penalties and kind of how does this go, in 2014 was a great year for uh, the Department of Justice because they were able to get $1.56 billion from companies. Now, just to give you an idea, over the last couple of years, this is only, they've been really only uh, prosecuting two to 13 companies per year. So you can imagine that last year, in 2016, the smallest fine was 335000 and it went up to $283 million. So you have to really uh, you know, realize that there, there's teeth in it now. They're going after companies that are bribing these officials. So when we look at who does this apply to, it really applies to all U.S. corps, and again, people who are touching the U.S. And it's unlawful to pay the foreign official for business, but you also have to ensure that from a company standpoint that you keep really good books and records showing where all these payments go in and out. Let's not have a cash slush fund in many countries, and that's what companies used to do. So you can't do that anymore. You have to be able to account for all the money coming in and out. And really ensuring you have adequate accounting controls over that, over that cash usage. And um, so it's also important, important that you make sure that your employees understand what consists of a bribe and, in many cases, what consists of a Greek payment. So the next one, which is even tougher, so we got FCPA, and okay, that's, that's rough. You get, you get caught offering out a bribe to somebody. Well, the UK said, we're going to do that one better. So we're going to have the UK Bribery Act, which, as they say, is the toughest anti-corruption legislation in the world. 
So the trick here is if you have any connection with the UK at all, this does not have to happen on UK soil. Again, if you have offices there, you have people around the world acting on behalf of those offices, you fall under this category. So to um, also what's important is it's not just where the crime occurs, but also failure to prevent the bribery. So if you're, you don't have good compliance at the corporate level, they can come after you at the corporate level. Also what's interesting here is that it's not only, it's both sides. So either you offer the bribe or accept the bribe. That means it's covered under UK bribery. So the big part about this is understanding who you're working with. So it's kind of know your customer, which your banks are really involved with. So understand who you're working with on the other end and really ensuring everyone signs up to no bribing. And UK also considers grief payments um, to be part of this legislation. And a grief payment is typically where you pay somebody, you know, 50 bucks to, to uh, deliver a message or, you know, put an extra little bit of money to make sure your goods actually get shipped out that day. Um, so it's kind of a doing business as usual is covered as a, an act against this UK Bribery Act. So it is a violation of this particular statute. So how do they differ when you look at FCPA and you look at UK bribery? Oops, sorry, let me, let me back up for a second. Just to give you an idea, okay, so we, we in the US look at this from a monetary penalty. In the UK, you can go to prison. So it's a, a very exciting um, situation. And an unlimited fine, which is also very exciting. And they can confiscate all of your property as well as disqualifying you as a director. Probably that last one is not as big as the first three above that. So it is, they put a lot of teeth into this piece of legislation. So how are they different, the FCPA versus UK bribery? Please note that it, FCPA is a little bit more lenient. It only applies to uh, foreign officials where UK Bribery Act is to anybody. It's just any kind of bribe. And also with FCPA, it's mainly to the person giving the bribe, and UK is either giving or accepting it. So now I'd like to move on to uh, the last trend that we're going to cover today, which is streamlining global payroll compliance and uh, tax compliance. So what we'll see here is there's kind of when you think about payroll's last mile, you really see that in some countries, it's still very highly manual. There are countries in the world where you have to get into transportation, I won't even say car, and go to another location and get off and file paperwork by hand and get it stamped and file compliance completely manual. Or in other countries, there's no last mile at all. In fact, it's becoming so highly integrated from an HRS uh, changes right coming out of your HR system right directly through payroll and into government filing. So that's what we're going to talk about here next. So there is some challenges to that automation. So in, in countries that don't have an HCM system, uh, they have underdeveloped infrastructure, bureaucracy, and poor governance, and they're still doing many things manually with the stamp. But in some countries, what they're doing is they're really trying to automate that last mile. And they're doing that through centralizing a lot of their processes. And in many countries, there used to be like 10 different filings you had to do. And some of them were forms, and some of them were automated. And today, they're saying, wait a second. No, we're not going to do that. Let's try to streamline that all into you know, one payment, one uh, feed of data into the government. And there's a need for real-time information because companies are going, wow, that's interesting. I actually can get all the data on my, the people that are working in my country if I could just get it real-time. So it's an incredible way for them to learn more about their employee, or their uh, citizens, base of citizens, and the people who are working in their country. So the big goal is to reduce that red tape and, and those manual processes. So let's take a look at a couple of those. So a couple of them here. Um, the UK was the first. Now, I'm taking the US out of this picture because I know that we have been automated down into like state filings and government filings for quite a while. 
But the UK really led in 2013 with real-time information. So providing that data into the HRMC, uh, new hires, changes, payroll data, much quicker and much more, quote unquote, in real time. France was the next one with uh, DSN. And under DSN, I'm not even going to try to say that in French. What they did is they took 12 different filings and they moved it down to one integrated approach where companies can just send one filing over to the government with all the different components of like new hires, people who went on PTO, maternity, paternity, um, increases in salary, all those kinds of things go over through one pipe. Then Brazil has not been quite as successful with this as something called eSocial, which if any of you have been on these kinds of presentations, have been probably talking about eSocial for the last mm, four years. So they're going to try again for January 2018. And again, it's a whole streamlining of the process of, of providing data into the government and reducing the number of separate submissions that need to be placed. The interesting thing is they're also capturing an enormous amount of additional data. I think it used to be you needed like five or ten items to get uh, someone up on payroll in Brazil, and now it's north of 80. So they are capturing a lot more information. And the last one here is Australia, which is they put together um, last year something called SuperStream, and were very, very successful. That's allowing in Australia, they have all these superannuation plans, and they had like hundreds of them and they got them down into filing through one format, which was hugely successful. And now they're moving to something called single touch payroll for next year, and very similar to the UK RTI of being able to file and pass uh, payroll data in an automated fashion. Michelle, so, Michelle, this is Cecile. I just wanted to say that since you said e-social, if you go back to the de Déclaration, Déclaration Sociale, you already said that properly, so you could have done the French one after all. Ah, oh, excellent. <laughs> Thank you very much. So Cecile speaks French, so we're all good with that. <laughs> I should have let you said that, say that one. <laughs> Thank you. So kind of where are we going? So when we look at the future landscape of, of cloud, cloud HR, payroll, and finance, they're all very integrated together. So now when you're looking out not too far into the future, you're going to see all employees going into a global HRS, which then feeds the information down into payroll, whether that's a local payroll partner in each particular country or a multi-country uh, uh, payroll outsourcer, which may be doing multiple countries or a regional player that will be handling it for you. All that data is going to go direct from uh, the global HRS into these payroll locations. And then what's going to happen is those payroll locations are going to process payroll and they're going to feed that data back up into the global HRIS system, which then in turn can feed that data back to the employee. So they'll have one single place to see everything that they're doing, which is very similar to how we work today with Ultimate Software. But finally, also, the data is going to go out to HR, so, I mean, to finance. So the GL is going to be automated in all of that information, which is very similar to what's happening today. But in the future, the next step is that data is then going to go from, go from the, all the payroll processors directly into the government agencies. So you can see how the HR, payroll, and government interconnectivity is getting tighter and tighter and tighter and faster and faster. So it's really, really critical for companies to understand their HCM strategy, how they're tying their payroll in, how that payroll then is tied into the statutory government, to, and, and also how this whole picture here is compliant, both from the global aspect, like the FCPA, and for OFAC, and for EU data privacy and all the other privacy components that we haven't even discussed for other countries in the world, and still being able to make this happen in real time to meet those statutory requirements. So this is kind of where I see us going forward, and it's very exciting because we're, we're all not there yet, um, but there is definite movement, and we've seen an acceleration over even just the last 15 months as we're getting and automating that last mile. So, Darren, I'll pass it over to you if you have any questions. Or, Cecile, do you want to add anything else? 
No, I, I think that's I think that's great. I think that the importance of looking at the at the future and recognizing the direct connectivity with the country <coughs> agencies and the regulatory bodies really puts the onus on uh, your your partners and also on the on the customers on all of our customers to really understand and have a good grasp on what the expectations are and what the compliance needs are and that's where communication is so 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 important so um, no I think it's, it's great to have the expertise to share and let's open it up to any questions all right so we do have a couple of questions so uh, first question is for Cecile um, so what are the minimum password requirements for ultimate software and even I kind of noticed the password you showed you know, was huge, right? So, uh, what are kind of the minimal, what are kind of the minimal requirements around uh, passwords yeah. that we should be implementing? No, that that's that's a that's a fair question, and and what I would say is there are some there are some general guidelines that uh, we adhere to, and and you know rather than just saying that these are the specific requirements, we look generally at what are the best practices, and just a couple of things. Um, Again, that, that makes sense, but you'd be surprised what length uh, that hackers will go to to get information and try to hack, hack uh, into, into systems and passwords. So first of all, uh, use a minimum of 10 characters whenever possible. Uh, make sure that those, that those, those passwords include um, special characters as well, that they never include pet or kids' names, things that might be discoverable. Uh, on Facebook, for example, um, because people will actually look around and see if they can identify what might be used as a password since uh, password management can be a challenge, which is another reason why sometimes it's a really good idea to bring in a password management system. Uh, the other thing to make sure of is from a, from a minimum, we have expiration minimums and everyone really should make sure that their passwords expire and force users to truly change them, not just changing one character, but really forcing that to change. And then, you know, again, wherever possible, use password generators and password management systems to facilitate that, because it can be overwhelming if you need to use different passports or passwords for all of your different systems, uh, making sure that you don't duplicate those, so. Okay, great. Um, next question. So. My bank runs OFAC checks before making payments. Is that sufficient for my organization, or do I need to be doing something else? Okay, actually, it's a, a really good question. And you know, probably five years ago, that's exactly what most organizations did. They really didn't worry about OFAC, hence the reason why it's one of our, our trends that we're discussing today. Um, but now, what's happened is, yes, your bank is going to do it, and your bank also comes up with a a whole bunch of other kinds of compliance checks that they do that they'll never tell you because that's part of their compliance program is to keep ahead of, of um, their, their customers and other people. So, but it's not sufficient. The point is at the end of the day, the relationship and the person who's executing the re request to make a payment is the organization itself. And the U.S. government has become very aggressive in saying you need to have an OFAC compliance program. You need to be running these people, organizations that you're dealing with, uh, partners that you're working with, vendors, et cetera, through the program so that you are proactively aware of the situation before it ever goes through your bank. Great. Thank you. Next question is the organizations and agency mentioned on the prior slide, so this is kind of in the middle here, are um, for Europe, mainly European focus. Mm -hmm. Is there any sort of trends in Asia that um, people should be looking for? So there, there definitely is um, for Russia. So Russia is a, has has come out specifically and said they have some uh, very core restrictions about moving data on Russian uh, citizens in and outside of Russia and requiring that the data be held on Russian servers. Um, there also is in, with Russia, and if you look at the requirements there, you can move data back and forth outside of Russia, but you have to be really up on the requirements of what you have to, what you can move and what needs to uh, at least have a copy of in Russia. Ch uh, China has been going back and forth also 
uh, about different data protection requirements, but has not settled down on anything yet, which can which we need to comply to at this point. I think the big thing is always look at data as, if you look at the same principles that you deploy in the EU, is a really good rule of thumb for the rest of the world. Because even if they don't have it yet, it's probably coming. OK, great. The next one here, we could probably talk for 45 minutes, so we'll make it fast. Uh, what is Solergo's vetting process in dealing with in-country partners? Okay. So for anyone who's working with a in-country partner, it is important to ensure that you have a specific set of requirements. And that is everything from, um, and that's whether this is our policy, but should be anybody's policy, is really important to ensure you have financial stability of the organization, um, understand their IT infrastructure, prove out their IT infrastructure. And that's not only from a um, data privacy, but also from a business continuity standpoint. And then you get down into some more of the complex components of it. Uh, do, is there a requirement for multiple language? Um, how do they handle an expertise component? Um, how do they manage their own internal risk for the region globally? And so we take many of those components. It's, it's quite a lengthy process to go through. And, and for us, not only doing it once, is not sufficient. We continually are going through that audit process, whether in all in in total, or also in components as situations change, as EU data privacy changes, for example, or local data privacy changes, or IT standards increase. Then we come back to our uh, partners and ensure that they are compliant. All right. And then last question for the moment. Last time we have some more is how can I confirm so. There's a lot of, you know, privacy shields, big, important thing. How can I confirm that a company actually went through that process? Okay. So, so yeah, privacy, Michelle, go ahead. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Cecile, do you want to answer that no, one? No, you, no, no, you've got, you've got it, please. All right, for the last minute. So you can actually go online and search for Privacy Shield, and it takes you to their website. It's real simple. You click on the button. You type in the company's name. Make sure you have the right legal name, and it's not an acronym or something to that extent. And it will show you whether that person has been self-certified um, and tells you, I think, the start and the end date, too, of that. So just all you have to do is go in and, and uh, type in the company's name, and it should appear. And you will and definitely I, find Ultimate Software uh, on that list, just, just letting you know. Uh, we're on that list, too. Otherwise, we wouldn't, we wouldn't exactly. be having a conversation. <laughs> um, and then one final one just uh, hopped in, and I think you kind of answered this, but um, does UK Enter Bribery Act apply to me if I'm not headquartered in the UK? So I'm US based, I got a few people in the UK. Does that apply to me still? Or is that something you know I don't have to worry about? Yeah, you, you do have to worry about. So if you um, if you have employees in the UK or you have entities in the UK, um, I believe it might even stretch out as much as if you do business with the UK, you are uh, you you do have to comply with the UK Bribery Act. I mean, it's just good business anyways. So to make sure that you have a good anti-corruption and anti-bribery program in your organization. Uh, but you know, there's probably many others. We've only discussed just a few here today. So just be aware that each organization each and each country has a you know, whole set of rules around things like corruption and bribery and, of course, data privacy. Great. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming today. We will follow up with everybody with a, a thank you and a, co a copy of the recording. If you are actually looking for a copy of the presentation, um, please email me directly. I think most of you have my email from all of the from the invites that came out. So please uh, send me a note directly, and I'd be happy to uh, you know PDF that up for you. Um, and thank you so much for attending, and look for our next. Uh, webinar um, sometime in mid-September. So thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And uh, if you, anyone has any questions, uh, you also have my email. So please reach out, and I can work with uh, Michelle and Cecile on any answers you guys may have. Thank you.